Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. God, your mercies are new each and every morning. I thank you that you have called each person here, whether in person or online. God, you have called us into your presence. And in your presence, your scripture says there is peace. Not as the world gives peace, but only the peace that you give. And so I pray for your peace to fall this morning, for joy to fall, for us to understand our purpose in you, Jesus. And so would you speak to us through your word? God, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. God, as we, uh, in this movement, we acknowledge that you are moving and you are living. Your word is living and active. But may everything we do, may it be for your glory. Not for Wilshire's name, not for the brand, not for any of that, but for your kingdom, for your glory. So God, may we first seek your kingdom. And may everything else, may you add to us because our eyes are so focused on you. And it's not because of our strength or look how good we're keeping our eyes on you. But it's grace and mercy in your eyes. So I pray we see you face to face this morning, God. Because of the mercy that you have called us, the grace that you have called us by. So may we see you, may we hear you. May our lives be transformed in your name, Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, say hi to someone and take us as you grab a seat and... Maybe a high five, a handshake, a hug. So it was one Sunday morning and uh, my, my youngest comes in, bam, like, opens the door and, you know, as a, as a dad, sometimes you're like, all right, like when somebody comes running in, you, you do the quick assess, like is blood gushing out, like is a bone sticking out, right? Sorry to be gruesome, but it's just like you, you do this check, like when somebody comes flying in, you're like, what? And, and my youngest is like, dad, 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 dad. And I'm like, what, 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 what? And he looks at me and I'm like, look at his face, you know, doing all the assessment. Are you bleeding? Like what's going on? And he's got peanut butter all over his cheeks. And I'm like, bro, what? Like, what? Did you get in a fight with the peanut butter jar? Like, what's going on? He goes, oh, I had peanut butter jelly, like peanut butter breakfast and uh, wheat, wheat bread and peanut butter. I can't even talk this morning. But I, I'm looking at him like, what is wrong with you? And, and then I was sitting there, I'm like, well, what would you need? I'm like, you got to wipe your face off. And, and he was like, oh, I forget. And he's sitting there. And I'm like, man, you got peanut butter all over you. Like, came rushing in. He's sitting there and he goes, oh, he goes, today's Sunday? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, church day. And he goes, I put my Bible by the door so we could go out to church. And I was like, oh. I was so focused on his mistakes, I almost knocked him off course. I was focused on his shortcomings instead of what really mattered. And I wonder how much in life do we often do that, whether it's shortcoming of somebody else around us or our own, and it really pulls us off the trajectory that God has for our lives and our, and our just in, in our relationships, in church. I mean, think about this in relationships and friendships and marriages. It, it isn't always, sometimes there's the, the sad and devastating cases, but also sometimes you look at the way relationships go, it isn't just one morning you wake up and just say, oh, I, I hate this person. But it, it's slow. It's a buildup of going different ways. And sometimes one of the things that studies show that's a killer of relationships. And I'm talking friendships. I'm talking marriages. I'm talking coworkers. All of that. Classmates. Is you're there, it, it's, you can slowly grow apart. And it might just be in your own mind. And one of the things that we carry is seeing the, other, the faults of other people are holding on to resentment and pain and hurt. Uh, the head of John Hopkins in Mood Disorders, he says, holding on to resentment is actually a physical burden and harm that we carry. He, he says, we see patients that are holding on to resentment and they're worried about other people, the way they've been hurt or other things, and it says, and it affects their body physically. So this morning we're talking about the sermon title, and you can write this down, 
is finding freedom in forgiveness. It's finding freedom in forgiveness that Jesus gives us. And so we're going to look at a story this morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to go to John chapter 20. And in here, if you don't have a Bible, recommend the Version Bible app. Download that. Um, and that way you can read it through throughout the week. We also have physical Bibles if you like kind of analog, right, and actual pages. So we've got those for you as well. Uh, but here's picking up John chapter 20. Remember, John is one of the closest disciples of Jesus, kind of the inner two. There's Peter, then John. And John writes this. He says, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, Locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. So, again, we're, we're kind of going back to the resurrection story. And, and why the resurrection story? Because we believe that Easter is not just the end of the season. And we talk about it a lot around church, right? Easter is like the Super Bowl. And it's beautiful because it's, it's like, it just, without the resurrection, nothing makes sense. So that part's true. But the one part that's not true, Easter is not the end of the season. It's just the beginning. You look at Pentecost in the church calendar as the Holy Spirit is moving and active. The, the church, the, the beginning of it, it's just the beginning of the Super Bowl. So it's like Super Bowl at the beginning of the season. So we're kind of looking at resurrection stories and how does that impact our lives. Because Easter isn't just one day, uh, one day a year. So he goes on and he says this, Jesus came and stood among them, peace be with you. Now notice the disciples, they're there, they've gathered, they, they have the doors locked, and why? Because of fear, worry, anxiety. Notice that fear will lock you in in your life, won't it? Fear of losing a job, fear of not getting loved back, fear of you name it, and what does it do? It, it locks us in. It locks us in and it keeps other people out. And so we think we're, we're guarding ourselves and, and sometimes it's a, it's a defense mechanism and sometimes that's just part of the way we've experienced so much and so we're trying to protect ourselves so it's not all wrong. But fear, anxiety, the pain of loss which the disciples experience. They'll lock us in. But here's the good news. It says that Jesus came, the doors were locked, but Jesus came in to be with them. And what does he say? He says this three different times, peace be with you. So I don't know how you came into these doors or you came here online. But Jesus comes and he says, I don't know, whatever you're going through, he says, peace be with you. The worry, the job, the news of some sort of ailment or family member or illness or chronic illness. And so on. I need you to hear that Jesus comes and he says, peace. You see, because the disciples, it, what doesn't change, because Jesus interacts with the disciples and then he comes back a week later and they still have the doors locked. There's still some fear in their lives. You see, peace, when Jesus says, peace be with you, peace is not determined by our circumstance, but it's determined by the love of Christ. You see, he says, peace, he, and earlier in John, he says, peace I give you. I don't give as the world gives peace. So the world, the way the world gives peace is by circumstances. And how many of us know no matter how much you try to get all of your circumstances, everything aligned in your house, everything aligned in your career, your academic career, it, there's always something that comes up and you fall short or there's a problem. Amen? But Jesus says, we might have the doors locked, but he comes in. Not barging in in the way that he's forcing them to submit to him, but what does he say? Peace. Be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Three times John notes that Jesus says that. So may I don't know how you came, and if you get nothing from the sermon except the peace and presence of Jesus Christ, my heart would be happy. 
Because I know that's how Jesus comes to us. He brings peace and not as the world gives peace. You know, so he has this interaction with the disciples. And, and so he shows them his hands. And he shows them his side where he was stabbed, where he was pierced. You know what the Bible says? That Jesus was nailed to the cross. Nails were in his hands. He was pierced in the side. It was because of our wounds, our sin. It's by his wounds that we are healed. It's our sin that nailed him to the cross. And that's what the scriptures say, that it's, it's my sin. It's my brokenness. But what Jesus says, he, he shows them his wounds, and he says, it's me. And then it says the disciples saw, and then they believed. Now, where it gets interesting here, continuing on in the text, it says they had great joy. Now, think about this. Jesus says this, this interaction with them, and then he says this to them. Peace be with you. So the second time he says it. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then look at this next line. So, right, he's giving them the Holy Spirit. He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, what an interesting verse, isn't that? Like, we're going to unpack a little bit of what Jesus is saying, but the, the first thing before, you probably have some questions about that, like, what? Like, Jesus is saying if these disciples don't forgive somebody, they're not forgiven. But before we get to that, we need to look at the important fact that Jesus, right here, he's saying, he's with them. They're now seeing and believing for the first time that Jesus truly is who he says he is. They're believing this, and then he says, I'm sending you on mission, and here's what you got to do. you got to forgive people's sins. And, and what we know from the scriptures, God alone forgives sins, but he is calling them to forgive others, and that's what we're all called to do. But the question is, how do we do this? If this is so important to Jesus... And I'll explain just a little bit. Let me show you another reason it's important. In Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches his disciples on prayer, we know this, right, in the Our Father, who art in heaven, he continues out this teaching on prayer, and then do you know what he lands on right after that? Forgiveness. And he says, if you do not forgive, the Lord will not forgive you. So the disciples know that they're not just hearing, okay, if you forgive somebody and they're not, if you don't forgive somebody, then they're not forgiven. The disciples aren't going, oh, great, now we have the power. Like that dude, I never liked that dude. Let's not forgive him. No, they know and they remember Jesus' teaching. If we don't forgive them, we aren't forgiven. And so this is how important it is. In the Lord's Prayer, Sermon on the Mount, you see everything Jesus is talking about as he's meeting people, the disciples in the resurrection, and he talks about forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, forgiveness is essential to the gospel. It's essential to our relationships. It's essential in the big moments of forgiveness when the big terrible things happen, and it's essential in the day-to-day -day little interactions, how do we forgive one another? So the question is, how do we do this? We're going to look at two things this morning. I encourage you to pull out your notes. Um, we're going to look at two different ways. And number one here is forgive us. The first thing that, that we're to do is forgive us. Well, what do you mean by that, Rob? Forgive us. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 4. When taught how to pray, Jesus says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Some of us grew up learning the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now what I love actually about that word, even trespass, it, it's not a word that we say, right? Like, oh, like your trespasses, we, we don't say that. But it, it's a great word because when you actually think about when somebody trespasses, They've offended you. They, they've stepped over. You had a boundary, a property line, and they aren't supposed to go over it, and they go over it. 
So when somebody trespasses against you, they hurt you, they said something about you, they harmed you. And some of us are carrying the wounds the way others trespass against us. But notice how does he begin? Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. And if you think about it, that's a picture of the garden. That's where the first trespass occurred. God said to Adam and Eve, you have the whole entire garden. Go wherever you want, but do not eat the fruit of this tree. There are boundaries. And Adam and Eve trespassed. They broke the Father's rules. You see, every time we sin, disobey God, whatever you want to call it, we are trespassing against a holy creator who has set boundaries, who knows, who designed you, knows how you were made. And so anytime we sin is going against our very nature and against a holy God. It's a trespass. But the good news is he forgives us our trespasses. He calls us. I mean, look what the scriptures say. John, who wrote the gospel of John, also writes this. If we confess our sins... He'll think about it and decide whether or not to forgive you. No. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He goes on to write in the next chapter. He says, I'm writing to you what? Dear children. And I love that. We don't even have time to unpack children. But circle that. Highlight that. We're going to come back to that. Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He has the bank account, if you will. I mean, imagine that, right? Going shopping and just saying, oh yeah, put it on Jesus' tab. It's amazing. You have been forgiven all of your debt. How many of us want to be debt free? And I'm not just talking financially. Spiritually. Jesus says, all of your debt, I paid it on the cross. So uh, John says, I'm writing you because I need you to remember this. I need you to know this. You are forgiven because of him, not based on your church attendance, not how good you are, not because of X, Y, Z, but because of Jesus' goodness. And so he says, I need you to know this. You have to know this. This is why I'm writing this. But if we're honest. Sometimes the most difficult person to forgive isn't always the neighbor, the friend, the spouse, but it's ourself sometimes, isn't it? And it's the, oh, you failed. How could you? We talked about this last week that it's not just I'm bad at this, now I'm a bad father, now I'm a bad coworker, I'm a bad neighbor, and it begins to be pervasive. And we also take it personal, right? We make it personal. So we didn't just fail at work, but I am a failure and so we have this in our lives and it takes deep root like the writer of Hebrews says this sin takes deep root in our lives but how do we find forgiveness how do we come to him daily look what Paul writes in Ephesians because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show us the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed what? In his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. To his kindness. The Lord is kind to us far greater than we deserve. So back to John. The disciples are there, and they're, they're overjoyed, they're ecstatic. But then John writes, there was one person missing, and his name was Thomas. And then John writes that it was also known as Didymus. Now some of us have grown up knowing, calling him not just Thomas, but what? Doubting Thomas. And like doubting Didymus, right? Doubting Diddy, whatever you want to say. That he's, but I, I think, and we've, We've preached on this before, that I think sometimes Thomas gets a bad rap. Because you see, Thomas, it says, it goes on and says that 
Jesus talks to him and then goes on and says this line where he says, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, because what, why does Jesus say that to Thomas? Here's what happens. The disciples are like, hey, yo, like we saw Jesus and they're just excited. And then Thomas says, he's, Thomas is very honest. I love this. We should call him Honest Thomas. He's keeping it real, right? Like he says this. He says, they're really excited. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put fingers where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. He says, yeah, okay, I know you guys are like my boys. We hung out three years, but I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Now, what you have to understand, what we might miss is this incredible part that John actually shows in, in verse 8. Which I love, John. He says this. Chapter 20, verse 8. He says, finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, which by the way is him. <laughs> I love John. He's like, by the way, the, the disciple that reached the tomb first. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I was a little faster than Peter. So here he said, like, he's got that in there. So I, I love John because he's very real, but here's what he says in verse 8. I think I always miss this because of the little humble brag in there. <laughs> but he says, he who had reached the tomb first and also went inside, he saw and believed. The disciples, the next part, it says, the disciples were overjoyed, I'm in verse 20, when they saw the Lord. That's when they believed. You see, they weren't going around after Jesus rose from the grave and, and when he was crucified, they didn't go, oh, yeah. No, they forgot. They forgot that he had mentioned it three times. They did not have faith in that moment. They were just like Thomas. They didn't believe until they saw. But Jesus says, blessed are those who believe and do not see. So the disciples weren't there, but he's giving that blessing for us. And this is where it's so important, brothers and sisters. Because just like when we see Jesus, when he's reaching out and he's saying, blessed are those who, what, essentially have faith. And that's where it comes down to forgiveness. You see, forgiveness, and now as we talk about forgiving others, forgiving others is not a feeling, but it's faith. It's faith. It's trusting in what Jesus says. When he says this is so important, it, you, I'll tell you this, you are not going to get like this squishy feeling inside and you're going to bubble over and be happy and just forgive somebody. It won't happen. It doesn't happen. And if we're honest, there's some really painful, and some of you have gone through far worse situations than I have. But wrestling with this, when Jesus says, forgive as you've been forgiven, this is essential to everything. For me, this, this was a journey. H having to forgive the man that killed my mom in a car accident. And the pain, I, I still don't have a bubbly feeling about this guy. But it's by faith that God has worked in me and working to forgiveness. It's a journey. And some of you, I, I'm not saying this lightly, some of you have had some deep wounds, some deep pain. And it's faith. Because what Jesus comes to Thomas and he says, don't disbelieve, but believe. And you know what I love what Jesus shows in the scripture, in this John writes down? When Jesus comes to him and he shows him, he shows him his hands and his side. And the scriptures say that he showed scars. He showed him his wounds where it healed. Now, that was always so interesting to me. It, the God of the universe, why didn't he do cosmetic surgery? Why didn't he just buff out the blemishes? Throw some little mascara. I don't know, not mascara. I see it shows how I know makeup. Some of you guys are mascara. <laughs> foundation. No, no, help me out, ladies. Uh, but right, what, why doesn't Jesus do that? Because, you see, sometimes it's by our wounds. You see, the, the nails didn't have the final say. That's what the resurrection shows. Our pain, 
the, the experiences that we've gone through, they do not have the ultimate say, but the healing power of Christ does. The scriptures say, it's by his wounds you have been healed. You see, the, the cross, the resurrection reminds us there is pain in this world, there is difficulty. And guess who nailed Jesus to that cross? I did. We did, the scriptures say. He was nailed to the cross for our trespasses, because all of us have trespassed. But he was wounded so that you and I could be forgiven and set free. So now he calls us. He breathed on the disciples. He says, go and forgive. And this is where it gets real because he first meets the disciples. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. The, Thomas wasn't there yet. And then it goes up. Look at this. You, if you don't read it slowly, you can miss this. Verse 24, now Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, right, he shares his doubts. I'm not going to believe it till I see it. Verse 26. He says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Let me just pause right there. Sometimes we express doubts. Maybe you're in a season of doubts. And Jesus doesn't come for a week. Sometimes he won't come for a month. And why didn't Jesus just appear? And imagine the questions Thomas had. Well, why didn't Jesus come when I was there? Right? Why do I always seem to miss out? Thomas probably had FOMO, right? They was just like, man, what? And he probably had doubts. Is it because of me? Like, did I do something wrong? Like, what's going on? But it was a week later, and then Jesus comes and says, peace be with you. Peace be with you and then calls him to believe. You know what I love about this though? The disciples are taught about forgiveness. Thomas says, I'm not going to see it till I believe it. Imagine your best friend, you're telling him like, hey, I saw Jesus, he was here. And then he goes, I don't trust you. But you know what the disciples did? He, Thomas was eating dinner with them. You say we, see, we say this here at Wilshire. You don't have to believe to belong. You can come in the house and you can be a part of the family and join us because I believe that Jesus will come personally and meet you. I can't convince you. It's by faith. It's by grace you've been saved. He's the one that works. And so Wilshire, we are a place where we will welcome people to the dinner table whether they believe or not. I needed an amen in that. Thank you. Because that's what we're called to do as a church. That's how we're called to respond. This is a place where you can belong before you believe. Because I believe in the power of Jesus. I believe he will meet people where they are. Even in their doubts. Even when they say, nah, 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 nah. He comes and says, peace be with you. It's up to him and his power. So may we always be a place where we welcome anybody, everybody and love them. And we're always going to say, hey, there are some boundaries, there are trespasses, and not, we're not going to just sweep all that under the rug. But when we trespass, there's forgiveness, and there's freedom in the name of Jesus. So here's a question. I, I want to get this super practical, and man, we could do a whole sermon series on this. I, I want to give you just a couple of ways to live this out in marriages, in friendships, in relationships, at school. Because Jesus says, right, to forgive one another as he's forgiven us. So how do we do this? How do we not hold on to resentment? I, I want to give a couple of practical steps. And um, yeah, let, let me get to this part. Where he, I've got so much here. And we'll come back to this. And if, if you're struggling with forgiveness, I'll, I'll say this. First and foremost, don't fight it alone. You can't. The disciples didn't. They broke bread together. Thomas was in there expressing doubts. And, and remember, if you're in life groups and stuff, we, we say this a lot. Don't like Jesus juke people when they express doubts. Don't just like fire Bible verses and somebody's struggling. What, what does Jesus do? Peace be with you. Be a person of peace. Don't be the Bible answer geek, okay? It, give people the Bible. But don't Bible bash them, amen? 
listen to them. What, what did Jesus first do? He listened to Thomas's doubts and he met his needs. Listen. Jesus didn't just come in and preach a whole sermon about the resurrection and the power of the resurrection and the atonement of sin and sacrifice and righteousness. And No, he says, here's, here's my wounds. A very practical, physical, tactile lesson. That's our Jesus. That's why he gives communion. Because I say we're dense sometimes. I, I need something physical to be reminded. So one and here's, here's the first thing. When, when somebody's wrong and you have tiny offenses, here's the thing. In marriage, all of these things, the, the scriptures say that each person in their own mind thinks they're right, essentially. Right? We, we've all got ways that things should be done. The way the laundry should be folded, right? The way, you name it. We have all a million quirks about us and somebody's always trespassing and we have all this anger and resentment that builds up. And so then we wonder why when marriages, relationships, children, parents, spouses, coworkers, life groups, right? Just people you live life with, they can do a million little quirks and it's not the way you would do it. And so you get angry. And then we start to say, well, they're doing it to bother me. No, they're not. Your way is dumb, their way is dumb, right? There is no set way. Each person in their own mind thinks they're right. Now, then there's biblical things. When there's biblical things and somebody's trespassing, walk with them. In a spouse, in a relationship, don't just bring it up in the heat of the moment, but talk about it. Here, here's a perfect example from the grace marriage. I want to read this. The author writes this, and the uh, husband and wife kind of co-author it. And so they're sharing, they're very, just sharing intimate parts of their lives. And they say this. He says, when I bred... Uh, worked as an attorney, I tried to be home by 5.30 to eat dinner with my family. But he says, my actual time of arrival was always late. It lagged. What time? He said, I had more meetings, more things, different things. And then his wife would tell him, hey, when you have five kids, 15 minutes matters. So at the end of the day, don't organize your desk or chat with workers, co-workers, get home. I like it. She tells him like it is. Hey, we need you home. You see, grace and forgiveness does not mean, forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Forgiveness does not mean just sweep every sin under the rug. You can set boundaries, trespasses. Hey, in our marriage, this is what works. In our friendship, I get hurt when you do this. Talk about these things. Write notes. Don't talk about them in the heat of the moment. Come back when you're cool, calm, collected. Amen? Because, whew. So many, when you're trying to fight fire with fire, it's not going to work. But they had this conversation, and I love that. Then he said, it would drive her crazy when I would pull up in the driveway, sit in the car on the, mom, on the phone for 30 minutes. Then he said, I, I learned to kind of course correct and park around the street and hide there for 30 minutes and then talk on the phone. But he says, I, I wasn't really addressing my heart. And then I love this. He says, it seemed like problem without a solution. I just kept going on and on. So how could we break the end of a workday conflict cycle? He says, only by the grace of God, of course. Marilyn took the first step. She decided she would greet, greet me warmly and speak to me the exact same way whether I got home early, on time, or late. She resolved not to, and this is good, she resolved to not let my timing dictate her mood. That'll preach. It says, it, he, whether he's late or not, I'm called by God to be gracious. So I'm going to, and I love, I, and then it says this, and grace, and her grace and love caused me want to honor her more. I stopped lingering at work and in the driveway. I couldn't wait to get home and experience God's grace through her. Can you imagine how different it would be if the, I'm so glad you're home, I really missed you today, compared to, seriously? You couldn't just wrap it up and get here again? Right? They're different. It, why? Because it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's the same thing, friends. 
When we're kind towards others, that leads them to repentance. And we said this last week, well, won't that make me a doormat? Won't that make me weak? You see, Jesus was held to the cross not by the nails on his hands. He was held by his love for you. You see, that's power. It's power because he could have got down, the scriptures say, he could have called legions and army, just angels and armies and armies of angels. He could have destroyed everybody. But he didn't. What, what did hold him, hold him to the cross was our sins. And that he paid that penalty so you and I could be free. It was love in his eyes. So it is not weakness. When you show grace, what does Jesus say on the cross when people are spitting him and mocking him? He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is power. That is is strength. When I hear men tell me, oh, that's weak and that's sorry, that's a real man right there. Who could destroy, has the power to annihilate, but chooses not to. That's fierce. That's grace. And that's what we're called to do daily. So when somebody is going through pain and you're going to help them, validate their pain. Don't just go, oh, well, for, you know, forgive and forget. Remember what Pastor Rob said, you just got to forgive. No, it was a trespass. You were not treated with the grace of God that you should have been. You were not seen as a son or daughter. And so mourn with them. And then work towards forgiveness. And remember, it's by his wounds that we are healed. That first God forgave us. And so I invite you before you even work on forgiving somebody else, First, work on your relationship with God. And I say work, it just means remembering what he's already done for you. Because you can't earn more forgiveness. He's forgiven you and loves you. And lastly, free yourself from resentment. Free yourself. Because think about some of what, if Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive others, I'm not forgiving you. And what is it really doing? It, it's harming you. Resentment, the, the studies show it actually harms you. Some people have said resentment is like trying to uh, hurt somebody else and go, oh, I'm going to get back at them and hurt them. But it's like drinking poison yourself. The resentment only hurts you. You, you see why? I, I was even listening to a TED talk a couple weeks ago. And this man that was searching for forgiveness who had been tragically hurt. And he was just waiting for that, that person to apologize to him. It had been years. And he said it was so interesting because he said that this man, when he met with him, it was only excuses. Right? When the perpetrator acts like the victim. Well, this happened, this happened. And because of his choices, other people were killed. This man was paralyzed his whole life. And he still refused to say sorry. But I felt sorry also for the man that was looking for that. For it, in order for us to depend on somebody else to heal us, it's not going to happen. Somebody, even if they do forgive you or, or they, they ask for forgiveness, is it going to be perfect the way you want it? It's not. You see, the only person that can forgive us, the reason Christ wants to give this to us, he says, I'm not putting this in human hands. You need to know that you are forgiven by your heavenly father. And that he calls us to forgive. And so he wants to set us free. It does not matter. That person, whether they choose to forgive you or not, is not going to set you free. Jesus Christ will set you free. And so that's the gift we get by forgiveness. It's being set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so I, I want to invite us to truly find that freedom. I want to invite you in a moment. We're going to pray. And maybe there's some things before the Lord you just need to confess to the Lord. Maybe there's some people you need to ask forgiveness for. And don't go back like, you know, you don't need to go back to kindergarten and like go back with the next girlfriend. Certain, th like, certain things are gone over, you, you need to move on, Right? You don't need to start texting your ex-girlfriend, like, maybe with a spouse. I don't know. We're, get some uh, counsel and advice on that. But, but what God's calling us to each and every moment is to forgive as we've been forgiven. 
And we can't forgive others if we don't realize the trespasses that we've done towards God. Amen. And so let's just take a moment, worship team, you can come on up. And let's just examine our hearts. Not out of guilt or shame, but just knowing God's great love for us. You see, forgiveness, it's by faith. It's not the feeling. It's not the bubbly, like, feeling good, but it's by God's great love for us. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you. I thank you that you are a forgiving God. God, I thank you that Thomas didn't have it all figured out, but Jesus, you came and you stood among him. The scripture says that the doors were locked. And some of us were doing that. We're, we're trying to keep you out. We're trying to keep others. We've been so wounded and so hurt. But God, may we see that you have come. As the scriptures say, the, the veil was torn that we could enter to the holy of holies. We could enter into your presence by the blood that was shed on the cross. So Jesus, may, may you enter the room right now. Enter into our lives and say, peace. Maybe there's things that are keeping us up at night. Forgiveness, that resentment we have not let go of. We're holding on to. And Jesus, you came to set us free. You said, whoever the Son sets free will be free indeed. And so, Father, I proclaim freedom in your name, Jesus. That it's by your grace that we have been set free. It is by your wounds that we have been healed. And so, God, may we find hope and healing in your name, Jesus. Knowing that, uh, as the scriptures say, all of our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. And so may we find that here this morning. Knowing our sins are great, but your love is greater. Your compassion is greater. And so, God, may we see how much you love us. We're your dear children. We're forgiven, set free based on your strength, your power that was displayed on the cross. God, help us this week as you commissioned, you commissioned the disciples to go and to forgive. May we be a people that are forgiving. May we create a culture of forgiveness in this community. May we create a culture that says you don't have to believe till you belong. You don't have to belong until you believe. May we know and teach that we are loved by you because you came and said, peace, peace be with you. So God, would you show us today how much you love us? Show us how we need your forgiveness. Show us how to forgive others when we don't know how. Make a pathway of peace in our lives. As you said peace towards us, may we say peace towards others. We pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you guys stand with me? Everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I've been washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside I'm Real than this in the 
presence of God. What my heart has experienced when my shame hit the wayside and my sin met the most high. I was washed from the inside. I was washed from the inside out. striving for acceptance let me tell you it's only by the blood it's never been about deserving or earning it's a gift that's freely given let me tell you it's only by the blood does anyone does anybody want to be holy or righteous pure tell you it's only by the blood does anybody want to be worthy forgiven justified really living let me tell you it's only by the blood hallelujah
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Can we give it up for the Lord this morning? Thank you, worship team. Uh, we got a message this week about um, two students in our down in Wilshire Ave kids. And uh, one of the kids came and said, Mom, I, I had a terrible day at school. It was terrible. And somebody hurt me and I just wanted to, to hurt them all day. But then somebody else that goes to Wilshire here reminded me of this little bookmark that we get. And it says, when, at, when possible, live at peace with everyone. So he reminded me, I, I can't hurt him back. I need to live at peace with him. And so he was at peace. Here little first graders are preaching the gospel to each other. And that's what Jesus is sending us out to, to be people of peace. To bring peace when this world sells clickbait is holding resentment, to hold grudges, to hold pain. And we are coming to proclaim freedom in the name of Jesus. And so whoever the Son sets free, may you be free indeed. So may we show grace instead of hold on to resentment. May we forgive instead of trying to act out vengeance and, and hold people to their past. So go, go in the power of Jesus Christ. Go in his forgiveness. Go in his healing. Go in the blessing. And if you need prayer, come on down for prayer afterwards. And we just pray that you'll journey with us in this season. Just encourage you, keep coming back. Be like Thomas. Just keep coming. And I promise Jesus will meet you. The peace and presence of our Lord and Savior. So go. As Jesus said to the disciples three times, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, I'm sending you. So you've been sent to be people of peace, people of forgiveness, people of love. Amen. God bless you. Love you, church. Have a great Sunday. See you soon. Yeah.